Take some good, long, deep in and out breaths. And notice where you feel the process of breathing. Allow your attention to settle there. And then you can change the rhythm of the breath if you like. Try to find a rhythm that feels good. But always try to stay with that sensation of where you feel the breathing. Because when we talk about doing breath meditation, that's the breath we're focusing on. It doesn't have to be the air coming in and out through the nose. Any place where you feel the energy of the breathing process. Any place where you're especially sensitive to the breathing process. Sometimes it can be down in the area around the heart, maybe in the throat, the middle of the head. Choose your spot. Or you can experiment with different spots for a while until you decide that you prefer one particular spot right now and one particular rhythm of breathing. It can be fast or slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow. It's up to you to find a place where you can stay. Because that's the purpose of this, is to stay with the breath. And if you're at ease with the breath, if you're not at ease with the breath, it's going to be hard to stay. We have a purpose for meditating. We're not just sitting here watching things arising and passing away and leaving it at that. We want to get the mind to settle down, because when the mind is settled down, it's a lot stronger and a lot clearer. You can see things a lot better and understand what it's doing inside that's creating suffering for itself. Because that's the message of the Four Noble Truths. There may be pains caused by the world outside, hurtful words, hurtful situations. But the real suffering that stabs at the mind is the suffering that we add to things outside. The Buddha's image is of two arrows. You get shot by one arrow, and that's not enough. You shoot yourself with another arrow. The first arrow is the pain that comes from, it could be physical pains, pains from other people's words or actions. But then there's a second pain. That comes from our own shooting ourselves with the arrow, the second arrow. And you know what it's like if you ever tried to shoot yourself with an arrow. It's just the act of getting the arrow aimed at yourself is painful enough. And then the second arrow goes in, and often we're not content with just the second arrow. We add a lot more. And that's what we're trying to get past. The Buddha talks about suffering on different levels, or stress on different levels. The word dukkha can mean either one. And that's the, the stress of the, what they call the three characteristics, or the three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. The fact that things are inconstant means they're stressful. And if they're stressful, why call them yourself? That kind of stress happens to everybody. But it's not the stress that weighs us down. The stress that weighs us down is the stress in the Four Noble Truths. And that's caused by craving. Craving combined with clinging and ignorance. In other words, things that are in our own mind. Now, the Buddha's not here laying blame on you, but he's pointing out the fact that if you want to put an end to suffering, you can cure the problem for yourself. This is actually an empowering teaching. If the end of suffering had to depend on the world outside being perfect, well, it's very far from perfect, and it's certainly not going to become perfect in our lifetimes. That would mean the end of suffering would be something that would be beyond us. But the fact that it is dependent on conditions in the mind, and we can learn how to gain some control over those conditions, that's good news. So that's our purpose in being here. And we always keep in mind the, the duties that are imposed by the Four Noble Truths. Stress or something is something to be comprehended. Its cause, craving and clinging and ignorance, is something to be abandoned. We do this so that we can realize the cessation of stress and suffering, which is the relinquishment of those cravings and clingings, overcoming that ignorance. And we do that by developing the path. Now, these are not duties that the Buddha imposed on us. He said simply, if you have goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others, this is what you've got to do. It's just in the nature of things. Which means this is not just a matter of right view, but also of right resolve. 
You want to act on the resolve to be harmless. You want to act on the resolve that all beings can be happy. Because if we can all find happiness within, then the question of who gets what outside becomes a lot less urgent. And people will treat each other a lot better. So these are the duties that are imposed by right resolve. And if you really feel good and well for yourself, these are the duties you follow. All the levels of right view have, have their duties. The first level of right view about skillful action, unskillful action, the teachings on karma. The duty there is if anything unskillful comes up in the mind or in your actions, you abandon it. And anything skillful is something you want to develop. That, the Buddha said, is a Catholic oracle teaching. In other words, it's true across the board for everybody. And again, the ought and the should here are conditional. They're conditioned on the question of whether you really want to put an end of suffering. You get to the Four Noble Truths, the duties expand out. Now we have cause and effect, skillful cause and unskillful cause and their effects. The unskillful cause is craving. The effect or the result of the unskillful cause is suffering. The path is the condition. It doesn't cause the end of suffering, but it takes you there. That's why the Buddha called it a path. That's the skillful action and the skillful result that's you put an end to all your suffering. So the duties begin to get more particular. You get into right effort and the duties to abandon become the duty to abandon what's already arisen this bad and then prevent anything unskillful from arising in the future. The duty to develop expands into giving rise to skillful things in the mind, giving rise to the path in the mind. And then once it's there, you try to maintain it and bring it to the culmination of its development. See, these are the things we're doing here right now. Like when you're trying to stay focused on the breath, that's developing concentration. Any thoughts that come up that would interfere with that, you, you let go. That's the abandoning of the craving. When the Buddha taught the Dharma wheel, he laid these things out. In fact, that's what the wheel is in that, in that sutta. In the old days when they would give lists of variables, like today we would put out a table, say, on a, on a piece of paper. You see, you have this set of variables on this side and that var set of variables across the top. And then you work out all the permutations. We call it a table. They called it a wheel. Because they wouldn't have diagrams written out on paper. They would just have you memorize all the permutations. In the case of the Four Noble Truths, you've got four truths, three duties, excuse me, duties appropriate to each, and then there are three levels of knowledge. One is knowing the truth, the second is knowing the duty, and then the third is knowing that you've completed the duty. Four times three is twelve. That's the wheel. So you think of it as a wheel with twelve spokes. And so as you're working on the duties, you're adding spokes to the wheel. And as to whether the wheel will take you all the way in this lifetime, that's, that's an open issue. But if you don't follow the duties, then it's certainly not going to take you anywhere. You may know the story of Shackleton and his expedition to Antarctica. They had a ship. They were going to land on one side of Antarctica, and they were going to walk across the whole continent. They had another ship waiting for them on the other side. But when the original ship arrived at the edge, they couldn't even get anywhere near to the land. They got stuck in ice, and the ice was going to crush their ship. So they had to leave the ship, get into little dinghies, and then drag the dinghies across the ice till they finally got to open water, and then try to row those across the ocean. It sounds impossible. But they did it, and nobody died. And as I said, the secret was that Shackleton kept reminding all the men, we don't know whether we're going to get out, but we do know if we do our duties, that increases the chances of getting out. It's a miserable thing to think about. If you, you got lazy, you gave up, and then you died, and then realized later, well, you gave up. The reason you died was because you gave up. If you hadn't given up, you wouldn't have died. So whatever duties the men had to do, they kept doing, doing, doing. 
the, the, the impossibility of the project get get them down. And they did some amazing things, sailing across a huge ocean, landing in South Georgia, and having to walk across the island. There were five passes that they saw from where they were standing, and they tried four of them and none of them worked. They finally was the fifth one that worked. So never let the situation get them down. This is important that you keep your spirits up as you practice. You realize that if you're going to make your way to release, it has to be through doing your duties. So don't see these duties as onerous, as a, as a weight bearing you down. They're an opening. An opening to freedom. Freedom from suffering, freedom from all the things that you've been weighing your mind down with for who knows how long. So as you sit here and things start seeming a little aimless, ask yourself, well, what is the aim here? What is my purpose in being here? There's something I've got to develop, or there may be something I've got to abandon. And as the path begins to develop, then you can get to work on that, that duty of comprehending stress. In other words, seeing it for what it is. The Buddha said it's five clinging aggregates, and it doesn't sound like anything familiar to any of, it, any of us. But he says that these are activities of the mind, and we cling to them, we feed on them, and that's why we suffer. You want to learn how to comprehend that. So if there's physical pain, you want to see, okay, the physical pain is one thing. The suffering of the mind is something else. We've got to learn how to take that apart. Now, to do that requires good, strong powers of concentration, good, strong mindfulness. And this is what we're developing as we work with the breath. So all of this has a purpose. It's going someplace. And by following those duties, it'll take you to where you want to go.